All right, well, welcome. It is now, I guess, 7 or 5 uh, on Tuesday, July 27th, and I want to call to order this regular business meeting of the Ferndale School Board. Uh, before we begin tonight's meeting, I want to once again inform everyone that we have made this, the decision to continue requiring masks be worn at our school board meetings. Um, based on the increasing number of COVID cases, uh, the number of people, including children who remain unvaccinated, and the prevalence of the new variant, uh, we think this is the safest decision to make. So I want to thank you in advance for complying with our mask requirement. So to begin this evening, will everyone please rise and join me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, the next slide on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. And at this time, I will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as written or propose any changes. I need to adopt the agenda as written. All right, it's been moved to adopt the agenda as written. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that motion carries. The next item on the agenda is 3.01 public comment. As is our practice, I will now recognize the audience members who wish to share comments with the board and who have appropriately signed in for that purpose. So Jackson, I have Anya Milton. Is there anyone else? That's it. Okay, Anya. Thank you. Board and administration and staff. I'm Anya Milton, Ferndale community member and a parent. I'd like to take a moment to share a few excerpts from a PhD student from the University of Wisconsin named Nicholas Daniel Hartlap on critical race theory. Critical race theory fixates on historically marginalized populations within the urban school settings and larger society. It implores all of us inside and outside the educational arena to equalize the educational experiences of students of color. It is accurate and justified to declare that the educational milieu of black and brown faces needs to be radically improved. His radical improvement will be made through critical research. The four of the five tenets of critical race theory focuses on the concept of storytelling and counter storytelling. This dichotomy, excuse me, this dichotomy is predicated upon the belief that schools are neutral spaces that treat everyone justly. However, close examination refutes this, simply evaluating graduation rates accomplishes this. School curricula continues to be structured around mainstream white middle-class values and therefore continues to be a widening of the racial achievement gap. Authors Hackman and Rauscher in their book, Equity and Excellence in Education states often underfunded mandates across the nation leave many educators wondering how best to serve their students, particularly those who do not fit into the mainstream profile or curriculum. In today's schools, the needs of students with disabilities and members of other marginalized groups often go unmet. And as such, more inclusive educational approaches need to be adopted to ensure that all students have access to a solid education, end quote. I speak in favor of including critical race theory within the Ferndale School District because it, because it will proffer the people of color an opportunity to examine their current positions in order to increase their social capital and cultural wealth. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anya, for your comment. All right, please note that in addition to providing time for public comment at our meetings, Dr. Quinn continues to write answers to questions received from the community during the previous month and posts those under the public comment item on our board docs agenda and also on the website. The next item on the agenda, 4.01, is the swearing in of our new student school board representative, Jazzy Gonzalez. Jesse, I would like to invite you to come forward with Dr. Quinn and me while Dr. Quinn is in the Thank you, Jazzy. So, Jazzy, raise your right hand and you repeat after me. Okay. I, Gonzalez. I, Jazzy Gonzalez. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. Support the Constitution of the United States. 
and the laws of the state of Washington. And the laws of the state of Washington. And the policies of the Ferndale School District. The policies of Ferndale School District. During my term. During my term. I will faithfully. I will faithfully. And impartially discharge. And impartially discharge. The responsibilities of the office. The responsibilities of the office. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations and welcome to the school board. Quick photo, guys. Let Jackson take a quick photo. Okay. Good job. Jazzy, that'll be your place. Jazzy, welcome. We're glad to have you on board and we look forward to working with you for the next two years. Awesome. All right, the next item 5.01 is a stand in report on our bond project. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Dubot to get her any updates. Thank you. So, we've got a few good news items um, this, um, this month. So, we just received um, one of the agenda items later on the consent agenda is a, a part of the uh, D form process, which is the process that we um, use to apply for state match funds um, for the high school project. And we were just informed by um, Heidi Hansen, the CSG, she was kind of um, going through the numbers again, finishing up the application. And we're eligible for another, an extra million dollars. Um, so, wow. up to $21.44 um, that was uh, uh, good news for the day. So the total, the total twenty one point four four million. Yep. So that's about of uh, the total bond plus that. That's about I mean, uh, eighteen nineteen percent. It was one hundred and twelve. Yeah. So we're getting another twenty one point four. That's awesome. So yeah. it is very awesome. Very awesome. So yeah, that's that's really good. So um, also next uh, September, the the bond oversight committee is um, planning to come and present their uh, next version of the quarterly report. Um, so hopefully everybody's prepared and and ready for that. If not, then I can share a, a change in plans if we need to. Um, the other piece of good news um, that we found out was that the um, underground fuel tank that was found um, by the CTE, the current CTE building in the parking lot there, a uh, bit of an unexpected location, um, the, it has been removed and all of the soil testing has come up negative. So we did not have any leakage from the tank, um, which is a, a tremendous relief. Um, in terms of uh, mitigating a, a contaminated soils in a, in a very tricky spot. So um, we're, we're very happy with the, um, the way that turned out. The other um, item is the uh, Cornerstone. Um, our construction partners have offered um, to provide a tour um, if you would like to come see what's going on at the job site. Um, so August 26, Thursday, August 26, at noon and at one. So because we can't have more than a couple of you at a time, we've got two different um, two different tours. And if you all five want to go, we'll we'll play play another time. We will we will generate a third uh, third time if everybody can make it um, and wants to. And we do um, noon because we hope that works for you, Melinda. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time. They've got um, some of the footings are still um, exposed. They're not all buried. They're going to be doing a, 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 some uh, slab pour. Um, the the uh, geo piers will be completed. Um, there's going to be a lot happening on the site. So you'll be able to see everything before it's all buried um, and while some um, some new stuff is going on as well. As well. I think we can accommodate you. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So please um, either get in touch with Jackson or um, probably Jackson um, if you'd like to come and which time works best. Um, and if you're flexible at all, uh, depending on um, you know if who who all can make it. If everybody wants to come, I'll, I'll definitely answer. Um, that won't be a problem. So I've still got a couple of comments. Any questions for Mark on this? The other thing I would just add is that we're um, we're also starting to meet regularly with the furniture 
furniture procurer. And so we, right now we're planning a, I think it's called a furniture fair. It's in, take, she said it takes 12 to 14 weeks to get the samples, but our intent is to have a furniture fair at Ferndale High School so that everyone can go in and within the choices that we can afford, talk about what, you know, what's their favorites. And um, so would that be a community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Staff students community. That's what we've talked about all the way along. You know, I'm sure it won't be a consensus, but, but everybody can have input. Invariably, there will be people that didn't know about it that don't like that color. Well, or, or the want completely opposite things. And you can, so, but we are going to provide that opportunity. And that's, so that I brought that up because it's exciting to me. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, you can find out more information about our bond projects and the bond oversight committee on our website and also in the weekly bond updates that Dr. Quinn writes uh, last week's was 107 was 117 bond oversight uh, update. So. I'm getting Jackson um, on board to continue those. Things. I quit doing them. The next item on our agenda is 5.02, and this is a review and discussion of the superintendent's monitoring report for operational expectations policy number nine, which focuses on the learning environment. We received this report at our June meeting, so at this time I'm going to open up for discussion. Well, I'm happy to start again, if that's okay. Um, so once again, this is fabulous. I think it's an education in itself to read it and to have it all in one document and review it is just stunning to me. Um, I was excited to read the part where the MTSS actually incorporates social emotional learning and PBIS because I was sort of like, oh, we're doing a new thing. And so to have that documented here for me to understand and see was, was really helpful. And because I've been excited about PBIS and I've been excited about MTSL. So I'm glad to see that MTSS incorporates all of that. Um, I really look forward to going deeper into the discipline data, which is actually the last monitor indicator that you put here. Um, I just think I just think that's something that we have to keep looking at and be aware of. One question, one of my questions, the one that I can think of right now has to do with, and I'm sorry John's not here because I think it could have been helpful. Um, so each year you talk about how the anti-bullying and civility policy are reviewed at the beginning of the school year with the staff. And I just wondered what that process was like because I could see where it's like, oh yeah, that. We're reading it's like, oh yeah, I read this last year. But do the staff really take time to reflect on what's said in there and their own perceptions and behavior, because it talks about trying to recognize and address behaviors, attitudes, and actions that constitute an impact of this policy. And I can see that looking at students, but I also think staff need to look at themselves. So is there time in that beginning of the year process to reflect on that? I would say probably not enough. I mean, I, I, I would say it's probably more cursory than, um, and it's like a lot of things you get it out when you need to get it out. But um, we have made it a practice to have to read it once a year. Probably not enough to be honest. I think that point of self reflection, though, it is so easy for us to see faults in others, but to actually reflect on yourself or what your own biases are or your own ignorances. When was this? The civility policy yes. or the yes. civility policy was put together by Paul and Paul has well, two or three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
I mean, I should remember, but I don't. Yeah, because it was. Okay. I also agree with Leanne and uh, more dissection of this list of data. Um, and I'd like to think about how we can get more stakeholder voices, particularly from the Latino community. I think um, we have had, and that I am in no way saying any fault whatsoever, but I think we have a great voice for our Native community here. And I think we need other voices for our other um, populations. And while I wish I could speak for them, I don't think I can. I, so I would love to draw in more stakeholder voices. Any ideas on how to do so? You're welcome. March of 2017. March of 17. Thank you. I love that the graduation rate um, is low. I appreciate it that the graduation rate um, between white and people of color, that percentage rise was pretty darn close. Uh, and it was interesting to see that income was the greatest, is where the gap the low income is. I did have a question on that chart though on page eight, because it says the total student enrollment of white is 78%. And Kelly was helpful before the meeting started. And our white enrollment is like 59%. Yeah, I, I think so, there may be some errors in that. Yeah, we just to look look at that chart again to see if we've got I think that also though depends on because. In, in my work world, white also includes Latino. And that's what we were asking, but we weren't sure what it was. So we'll explore. Um, yeah, one of the comments I had was the reporting of students of color sent to the office and non color students. And with the non colored, or let's just say white kids getting uh, um, you know, in trouble, just as uh, even more, but more of the color were sent to the office. And that turned up in this report. And that was very concerning to me. So I don't know how we can address that, look at it. Um, but well, maybe policies need to be changed. I have no idea. Uh, what I what I will say is it's something we've been tracking for about eight years. And not that this is great news, but we've gone, Kelly, what's the what did, we've gone from and 23% in 15 to 16 to 10% in 18, 19. So the gap has gone from 23% to 10%. So it's we're making some progress. Um, our goal is for the, there not to be any statistical difference, but it is definitely something that we've been looking at, and it will fall into the MTSS. The whole thing with MTSS is it doesn't take, it, it looks at a kid as a whole package, not PBIS over here, discipline over here, and social emotional over here, and academic here. Reading and, and and so we just hired, for instance, a behavior specialist for our district to be part of our MTSS team, so that there are ways to look at supporting kids and changing their behavior rather than just sending them to the office. Yeah. Well, my concern is uh, when we look at the whole picture, you look at the graduation rate again. You look at the income, the barriers all of that and this is on that written in this report so it's a uh, it's you know public record um my big deal right now is i trying to do a campaign for burndale i know you guys know how i feel about burndale and um i'm trying to get over that and uh we want our kids to be successful. Just like anybody else. 
like everybody else. So when I have to go campaign to parents and this shows up, how do I explain it? And then they come with their stories and whatever. But how am I going to say it has changed or it's better or it's, you know, we've revised this and that and the other thing. And um, we want our enrollment to be up, of course, because again, it comes to the budget and then those numbers rise. But how can I convince? I had a, a grandma sitting next to me. She's telling me about her girls having, her grandkids having problems. I was trying to convince her, send them to Ferndale. I can't believe I'm saying that, but send them to Ferndale. But she says, well, my girls, you know, whatever, they have um, opinions of their own. And I want to say we are going to do what? to make it a better place for all kids. I know we've put in place all kinds of programs. We're hiring a whole bunch of people and uh, people of color. That's what I keep trying to tell them. And it's going to be better. I, I know it is. But when something like this shows up, and it is public record, <coughs> well, how am I going to explain that? Well, I think just you. like. And just like Linda was saying, have, it's gone from 23% to 10%, and we have work to do, definitely. But maybe having a graphical representation of the change over time and that things are getting better and we are getting closer. Because while it would be fantastic if next year there's no statistical difference between anything and everybody is treated absolutely the same, it's with the reality, unfortunately, in our society is change takes time. But I think if we could graphically show, because it's easier to read a picture, maybe that might be a way to help convince people that Ferndale is changing and it's getting better and we are headed in the right direction and we're going to get there. I uh, I put out messages about um, students who want to go to college, become a teacher become something, you know, and come back to them. But they're like, you know, parents and grandparents who had their own experience. I'm like, I, I, I'm afraid to even go shopping in Ferndale. And, you, you know, you do your best, you try to do your best. And, but I hope this turns around. Well, I, I agree. I think looking historically at the data to, to here and not viewing this as sort of the starting point. This is a this is a point on our journey. Mm -hmm. And and the journey is different than it was five years ago. And so it's a journey and, and the journey continues, but yeah. not to focus so much on where we are right now, but where we come from and where we are going to go. Well I think you know uh, personally I think if we put out a message, you know, for recruiting and captaining and all that for Ferndale for enrollment, the board needs to put out a statement of some kind saying, you know, we're improving. Uh, we're, we're doing the best we can. You know, we're hiring this person. I know we've said that before, but like anybody else, you know, you've got to read it or you, to see it. you got to, you know, to believe it, you got to see it. Um, so a statement of some kind, maybe from the president, um, saying new and approved or whatever, um, that makes a lot of sense. Then I have something to, you know, back me up a little. And, you know, Jesse, I'm glad you brought the part about recruiting teachers, um, because that's, that's been one of my soapbox topics for a long time is we need to. We need to recruit kids to be teachers who didn't like school the way it was, not just the ones who loved the way it was, so that they'll figure out how to fix it for kids who, you know, we, and so that's what I think Grow Your Own is for. And we've been in contact with, um, there's a letter of support from Justin Gillery at the Northwest Indian College, and they're willing to partner with us. And the whole purpose of that Grow Our Own program is to try to recruit. Native American and Latin, Latin and other students to go into the teaching profession 
so that they will come back and help fix it or, you know, the, and they'll bring their experiences that were great right, and say, I'm not going to let this happen for the next, just like you're doing on board. But, and so that's exactly the purpose of that program. It's fighting that like general society message of, I can't wait to get out of here type of thing though. I think a lot of you know families might think my experiences were bad. And so my hope for my child is that they can leave. And you have to, you have, you're competing against that. And it's strong. It, it's, I know, but, but uh, also I think, um, you know, we need to do a better job of selling our profession and telling people that we don't want people who want to keep things just the way it is and letting folks know what a teacher makes. It's a good salary and a good job and, um, and that we are we're not inviting just people who want to, who are just like us and want to put it just, you know? so, I mean, that's part of the message. We're not going to get everybody, right? but I think we will recruit some if they truly believe that's the purpose. I think being upfront and proud of that message of that we want things to change is fantastic. So I think that's great. Well, I think that goes even to this report is not just looking at one aspect of numbers of those differences, but what it says about those differences in the statements that's being made is what we're working on. Because if you just look at the numbers, like I said, graphic res representation helps to see the change and improvement, but this also talks about goals in the direction we want to move and, and how we are working to get there. I think, I think, um, what Jesse's talking about a message from the board would fit nicely with our whole MTSS approach. You know, a board, we, we probably need to schedule a study session where we can spend at least an hour or two talking about MTSS and universal design for learning. But then to have the board come out and say, we really endorse this because it's going to address some of this. Kelly says every day, it's a strengths-based model going to find out what you're good at and we're going to quit just hammering on what you aren't good at necessarily and that the whole goal is to figure out how to remove barriers and provide supports so that every single kid is included welcomed and supported um, so anyway I, th I think that can be accomplished and that's a good suggestion I'd appreciate a study session on that. After reading through here, MTSS, I feel like I have a fairly good idea of what it is, but it felt to me that MTSS is very much a strength-based and this is what you're good and we're gonna build you up on what you're best at. And PBIS felt very much more of a punitive session um, thing. So, and I'm, I'm sure that's wrong because I don't think Ferndale does punitive type stuff, but just knowing the difference next yeah, time, I can yeah. benefit from study session and we're not we're actually not leaving pbs we're just folding it into uh yeah i i would we've got great people who can put in it 90 minutes probably because i think mark when you came away from the june meeting you you said you had a better way better understand there's some and so i'm using you as the yeah so went in without a whole deep knowledge and yeah I thought it was extremely helpful. So those of who are here, what does the acronyms mean? Multi-tiered system of support. Okay. And so um, it, and, you know, acronyms can just be clumsy and get in the way. But it, what it really says is that, like I said, we're retooling the way we think about things. First of all, part of it is to be inclusive. We, for too long, if a kid didn't function at a high level in the classroom, rather than ask the teachers to adapt, we sent the kid somewhere else, you know. And so it's how giving teachers the skills to, and that's where universal design for learning comes in, is giving teachers the tools to design uh, classroom experiences that will allow kids to, to succeed at whatever level or whatever supports they need. And it and you know your wheelchair is a support. 
Um, if you, you know, one of our teachers was saying she went on the line to get blanket and noticed how many different ways there were for her. She could watch a video on the screen. She could read a description. She could get into a chat with people. It's just saying, okay, we want to access kids what they know. And so we need to provide lots of options for them to do it. And if kids are successful, you know, how this can help really much, you know? And so, but, but anyway, and TBIS stands for positive behavior and interventions and supports. And all of these models, there's RTI, which stands for response to intervention. All of them are based on a triangle. And all of them say that all, all people, all kids, all everybody needs certain things. All kids need to know what are the behavior expectations in school. And they need to have more than somebody to tell them. They need to have a chance to practice it. Some kids in the middle here um, need more, whether it's math skills, whether it's social, emotional learning, whether it's behavior support. Some kids in there are going to need a little extra for whatever reason. And then some kid, a few kids are going to really need intensive. But even the ones who need the intensive support still need the base, too. We don't take them somewhere else and they miss all the base. So how do we build our system and, like I say, look at the whole child? So it's not, are you a reading problem or a behavior problem? You know, you're a kid. And so where are the obstacles? First of all, we're not going to talk about your problems. We're going to talk about strengths and where you need supports. But getting out of our silos to be able to do that. I'm envisioning these triangles as like mountains. And depending on where you need the support, your mountain might be in a different place. So it's more of a mountain range of support. Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a good analogy. I had another analogy that was really helpful to me. It's about similar to a dentist, right? We all go and get our regular checks, our cleanings. Our, those are routine things that we all need. They're universal. We all need those things. However, there might be a time where you might need a filling. So yes, you still need those regular supports from the dentist, but I may need to schedule a follow-up appointment to go get that filling. So it doesn't take away the other pieces, but it might mean that I need to do this, but I'm still getting the other piece. Or it might be some ongoing supports for a period of time or a crown, and you might need a little bit more than just a filling. And if that's the case, then you're getting what you need. And then for whatever period of time that is that you're getting that treatment, but you're not... You're not in the filling class forever. No, forever. You're going back, you're back this other room. Yeah. And you might need a root canal. That's what you you're kind of going on with for the rest of your life. You know, you, you know with, I, I don't know if the analogy works, but I'm not sure as much as most of us love dentists. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to. That's true. Speaking of the, the tears, one thing I noticed um, that said on here, when we were reviewing or going through, it specifically said that tiers two and tiers three do not include parent representation. And I was just curious as to what. I think that's um, more at a district level. Um, right now, certain buildings do have parent representation on the tier two committee. So as a district, entire district team, we don't have that representation. However, individual buildings, um, for the most part, do have a parent representative on the tier two setting, but the tier three setting tends to be more confidential in nature where individual students' um, needs are being discussed. So the tier two level, we may be talking about, hmm, this time of day, we're seeing more behaviors. What are some things that we can be doing? Or this location at this time of day, we're seeing more physical aggression. So what are some strategies we can put in place? But tier three is more of this kiddo, Kelly is really a problem, <laughs> and we're not going to have other people's parents talk about it. We that. for not to, right? For a number of reasons. <laughs> Just report on confidentiality. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We I actually have that as one of my commendations is I really appreciate the district's commitment to privacy um, while also giving the best educational um, learning environment to every kid. I think privacy is really, really important to kids. Um, they need that protection, and it, it makes me feel good that the school district is committed to that privacy. And from the other aspect, though, those kids that do need that extra support, 
then is there's communication. Their families are involved okay. in those plans. So once those plans are developed, parents are very much a part of that. Um, and some plans are, you know, once we go up those tiers or even check in on a daily basis, depending on the need of the kiddo. So absolutely, individual parents are involved in those plans. It's just not a representative on a general committee. I had a question on um, monitoring indicator 1.1 where the panorama um, questionnaire was talking about students saying they experienced supportive relationships at school, 76% in 2020 prior to the pandemic. In the spring 2021, 41% of secondary students and 53% of elementary students. Obviously they weren't at school in 2021, so I mean that has impact. But my question was, if you're saying they're not getting the support Supportive relationships at school. Have we, in this question, have we asked them what they need? Now, there's a question of, are you getting what you're getting? And they say no. Do we follow up and say what you need, or is it just? There is not that detailed, like next step to it. I would and love to have that. Too. And what I have to say about the panorama um, survey is that we were on a roll. And we just got started with this. Remember in 2019, we made the big push for cell. Panorama was going to be our one of our measurements. And when you do a survey like that, one of the things when you start analyzing is you go, okay, where do we go? need to go deeper? Where do we need to find more? And then we get struck by a pandemic. Kids are gone. And first, the levy failure, we canceled Panorama and the levy failure. Awesome. And so we, we haven't gotten the full benefit out of that yet. Would you say that's? I would completely agree. We're really looking forward to we do, capitalizing we, on what it has to tone, We know what's there. We started having conversations about, okay, we didn't, we didn't even do a great job of asking exactly the same questions from one time to the next. So it makes it even harder. Um, there was very poor controls on the 20, on the one that we did last year, you know, kids are coming from home or not, or, you know. So we, we shared what we have, but it's a snapshot. You're exactly right. It, 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 what it does is reveal where we need more information. It was, it was um, sad to read the numbers. And then if somebody tells you they're not doing well and you don't follow up with them, it was just like, that's heartbreaking. So I would say we did, um, our counselors did a nice job of checking on who are those kids, but the, the survey itself didn't lend itself to like a drop down, you know, what are you, you indicated this, yeah. the next step. but I would say our teachers and counselors were monitoring those numbers or monitoring those percentages and even making those comparisons. Um, and so that was done at the building level, um, especially by our counselors, but we're working right now um, saying that when we're meeting, they following us from Hawaii today. So we, she's watching here. Oh, we she were, decided her, because it was a mind trip. She just got to Hawaii, right? <laughs> 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 um, so we are all, right now already trying to build the, the windows for it so we can be very intentional in making sure that what we're getting is consistent throughout the year and we can capitalize on the full capabilities of the program. So we're looking forward to next steps. And I um, I don't think you were here, Melinda, or Jesse, when when we had a full year with our elementary counselors and they were putting out annual reports that they were really using this data to go deep. And it's, it's just not the same thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, Deb. Yeah. That's awesome. I would like to hear from Kong and Jazzy being the students of the learning environment. Uh, if they have any comments. I don't know if Jazzy even got so, And I don't know, Kong, did you read it? It's just like a general. So, so a more general question. Doesn't have to be on the report. Do you feel like the environment at the high school is supportive of you learning? Uh, uh, for me, I have um, um, I have like a speech about that on the way, but I will definitely have something done by our summer. Uh, I just want to make sure <laughs> you have a voice. Yeah, we have a, how's your experience? I mean, 
You're just a sophomore, so you don't have any She's a junior. Yeah, I, she's she's a junior. Really she's going to be a junior. No, it is. She, she's, yeah, once you get the sophomore, you're a junior. junior. <laughs> I, I barely do it for like the first few months. And I, I guess while I was there, it was like, okay, the teachers didn't really like connect with us like really one on one all that much. And then once COVID hit, it didn't really, like, again, I got in like lost us. So. So you had you transferred into Ferndale at the beginning of the sophomore year? No, I actually came to Ferndale in my eighth grade year, so that's pretty much all I have as the full year I've been Ferndale. So at the end of your freshman year, the pandemic struck. Oh yeah! And oh my gosh! Whole year since the middle, you know, I am so a bad person. So. <laughs> So she was there from September to March. Yeah. And then from March for a year and then a little bit last spring. So yeah. I didn't even go back last spring. I'd say she was, was, yes, that's right. You were so probably not fair. <laughs> well, that, that kind of surprised. tells us though that because kids are a lot younger than us. I mean, their school is such a big part of their lives that a year and a half is a almost all of your high school. So you may have been one of the people, I'm not saying what your answers were, but yeah, sorry, I'm just going to shut it. I appreciated, Melinda, that you said 1.1, because what I found out I was missing in, in these is that there are so many points that if we can find a way to letter them um, or number. Roman numeral them or something, okay. it would make there was somewhere in it where they were called out like a 1.1, and then I would count in but, but I do that just by counting. Uh, I, but why not? Okay. Yeah, change our bullets to number. Well, speaking of things beyond the interpretation and such. The other thing I noticed as I was going through is some of them said the superintendent will ensure, and then others went to, uh, bear with me a second, the superintendent may not tolerate. So it's sort of like, well, yeah, I've decided, maybe I'll tolerate that today, maybe I won't. And I was wondering if we should be consistent with I the superintendent happy. will not. I will tell you that that black language is what you adopted with yourself. But I, I agree. And I have just taken the liberty sometimes to make changes. You know, those <laughs> changes. That's but what we say it for. We can do that. I, but I, you know, I try to, but yeah, that's, I noticed that too. And policy government is always put in the negative, which is really frustrating. But that's why cohesive governance was more appealing because there was the opportunity to to put it in the positive. Yeah. So, but it just seemed May. It's like, well, that that in my mind is a wishy washy whereas will not is. Yeah. Especially, you know. Um, and speaking of which, one I did have um, the one of these reports like when you have sublog. Um, the the PBIS format is they talked about consistency throughout the um, page eight, and it says that the three overarching expectations: be safe, be respectful, be responsible. But then they go to high school and it's you know, it's responsible with ready, which I sort of understand that, but aren't they responsible to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I guess when you're in high school. Uh, I didn't understand the response. I just thought that was kind of a it, it was curious as to with their what the, the switch. I mean, we've taught them responsible, responsible, and then now you I don't know that the negates responsible, but I, I think um, I think the high school sees its um, role as uh, preparing kids to for the next step, and that's why responsibility becomes um, readiness. When I was a high school principal in a three-year high school, and I opened that new high school, we actually I forgot about this, but um, we said that um, we swing at sophomore generation. Sophomores are learning, juniors are leading, and 
we our L for seniors is leaving. And we said leaving a legacy, leaving behind, you know, we tried to move some of the leadership to the junior year, leaving a legacy, leaving the school to go on to the next step. And so I think the high school chose that to stick to the way to signal to kids and the kids. Is there any reason we couldn't just add it as a fourth and we still have um, responsible? We could. They've done a lot of logo work. And stuff. I mean, we, we kind of let, split, let them personalize it a bit. Um, so the high school PBIS team, Faye yeah. is texting me. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it says. The, um, that was a high school PBIS team decision to look at being ready for their future. Linda nailed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I I'm going to be far. And then three seems like the, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It just, it, you know, throwing out responsible, it's kind of like, oh, well, that's important too. Well, I think to be re ready, they thought you had to be, you had to be responsible ready. for getting ready. Yeah. Um, so then, it talks about on page six um, a self selection process. Um, in middle school to some of the more advanced or different courses and pathways, and then it says that continues in high school. And I appreciate self selection over, I need to jump through a certain hoop to get there. But on the other hand, if you don't think of yourself as someone who could take those classes, mm -hmm. you may not self select in, and you may be totally capable of doing the work. So I wonder what the process is to encourage that self-selection or to make sure that the students are trying these things, even if they don't really think maybe it's for them. Somehow, uh, I, I don't want them to shortchange themselves because they don't necessarily, at their age, have a vision for what they really should be taking. And on that other note too, that if somebody selects to get on that track in freshman year, they often stay on the same sort of self-selection track. Whereas what if that person who says freshman year, I'm not ready for this, I don't want to, but junior year, do we have it where they can jump in? Um, I've heard a lot of parents talking about how kids fall into a rut and it's hard to get out of that, that track. Well, and I think there's two other aspects that, that I think of. One that was, that was um, sort of, there was evidence within the pandemic from it, you know, and when we reviewed some of our technology uh, learning, and here were our goals for our elementary students, you know, but because we had to, you know, we had to go technology <laughs> all the time. They were getting up here when our, our original goals were here and it was like we set the bar higher because we had to and they achieved it i, I think on the other thing of the self-selecting is kids again goes to kids will achieve if you put higher expectations there they will get there or they're going to reach higher than if you put lower expectations um and i've had the conversation with linda before is i think sometimes our system gets in the way in the sense, the sense of I know of kids, maybe even my mom, my own at times, who have looked at, well, in order to qualify for this scholarship or for this college or whatever, you need to have this GPA. So I can either take the harder class and potentially get a lower grade, even though a lower grade of the harder class, I'd probably learn more than you know, easier class and get a higher grade. You know, so our, our system sort of sometimes perpetuates that. And it's like, how can we get, you know, ultimately the goal is learning. Yeah. You know, the grade is just a, a notation of it. It's back into those test scores. You know, how can we encourage kids to push themselves because they very well might accomplish things that they never knew they could or learn things that they you know, going beyond and putting those higher expectations. It goes back to that opt out versus opt in. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm very excited to share with you some of the UDL stuff that we've been learning about. Which is universal design for learning. Which talks about <laughs> giving kids more selection in the classroom themselves and how to, you know, selecting on every single project, maybe a harder project and changing the whole culture of, you know, 
Uh, it will be interesting. I mean, it's not going to solve everything. Right. It's not going to solve that day thing right now, although I think we can think about that too. But I, I think that, that selection piece, I've been reading the book and it talks about it every, every single day to be provided with selection and how far they're going to go and what they're going to do and be encouraged in a strengths-based system to take a harder route. You know. Huh. Um, is it like the, the culture of how like, you know, trying to push kids more, you know, achieve more better results uh, for me with how I, uh, with how the high school is with like honors classes, like I feel like students like to achieve more. However, with that, the same time they want better rewards. Like for me, when I do classes, I always choose I don't honor, even though I gain nothing from it. It's just higher, you know, knowledge. But and but you know, it's just that you know, people just a uh, student just want to like have like that saying like, oh, I did some honor class and I passed all the A's, and it just feels satisfied and you did that. That's only what all students to think. But yeah, I know there are states that um, actually give a weighted GPA for um, Washington does not do that. Um, and most colleges take that out in the do that. I appreciated your focus on relationships in here and the conversation about as students are coming back into the classroom that the importance of the relationship and supporting them where they are right now, not necessarily on getting through a certain amount of curriculum or a certain number of people. Because I think I think for teachers and students alike, this last year has to be horrendous. And we really have to give that foundational support of we're all in this together and let's see what each of us needs to I like the call out to the Be the One program and how the community can help in supporting the kids too. And it's a, a community member who wants to help out does not have to you know, sit on school board or don't, they don't have to you know, take on an entire classroom or you can, one kid. Thank you. I think it was hard with this report in some of the places. There's some were easy, compliant, non-compliant, you know, you know, compliant. But some of them were hard to really judge because it's like with the whole pandemic, how does that fit in? Because it just really, you know, it didn't fit. You look at it and go, well, that really wasn't, you know, was it or wasn't it? But it's just the same thing that we were saying with grades. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes if a pandemic happens and you don't have the data for that one, then yeah. You're not compliant, but it's we understand why. Yeah. yeah. There's that. Yeah. Other comments? Good discussion. Good discussion. Good discussion. That's what's the best part. So, okay. yeah, I guess they do another time. So, th this is again, yeah, these are all a huge amount of work. And, and um, I know how much I appreciate reading them. And you guys have talked about what do we do so others also see them like within the district. So what's going to happen to this next? We've reviewed it. I know we're going to have a cover sheet. We'll, we'll tell you it's compliant and how many are and how many aren't. And, but what happens for the rest of the district? Because this is a wealth of information. Well, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, what's happened so far is not much other than at this level. And it's but just like you say, it's been a learning for you. It's been a huge learning for us. You know, we went into this inventing this. Don't think there was any report form or anything. You know, we, we invented it all and we made up all those monitoring indicators. And, and, and I look back and think, well, that so now, mostly Faye and Kelly and I, but also all the executives are talking about how we do get this. One of the things that Jackson just did for us was print out three binders with all of these in hard copy. It's nice to have them on the um, 
Uh, it's nice to have them on online, but sometimes I just need to thumb through the pages. And one of the things we're even doing to get ready for next um, week's uh, retreat is pulling out some things that, you know, I've said in several of these, hey, we're doing just what you shouldn't do. We're trying to retroactively figure out what data we have. And so we're right now we're in the process of filling out or pulling out things that we want our principals to track over the year. So that and so we have a better idea of some of the data points. We've also talked about how, well, at the secondary level, for instance, with the discipline, I mean, not the discipline, dis, I mean, discipline in the way of subject matter, you know, the subject report, that um, Faye and I have talked about how those will become the property of the teachers of that discipline. So, you know, when she, and, and, I think Kelly, you have you have one administrator in charge of each grade, and Faye has put one administrator in charge of each of the major districts. So there's a administrator who's going to convene and go to the meetings on science and one on language arts. Obviously, you have to get involved, but that these reports on the, this one's a little more general. So I assume it would become part of our teaching and leading leadership, teaching and learning leadership teams at the levels. But we're finding a home for them so that they go there and that people know what's in these reports and say, oh, I can, this is what they're measuring. Oh, we need to do that. So that's what we're thinking about tomorrow. Okay, because I, I guess I, I think it's so much that we also need to be used. Well, and and I, but it could, it really is a five-year process. It really couldn't, we didn't, we couldn't have done it before now because we didn't know. I, I couldn't have done it before now. Um, and so I would also mention that we're pulling um, <laughs> of our, kind of our monitoring indicators from these and are including those also in our school improvement plans, like our district yeah, improvement right, plan. Right. They are being included there. And that also is a <laughs> format we're using with our school improvement plan. So what, what we are trying to say, these are the things that are important to us that we're valuing. And we are not only identifying those in our plans at the district and school level, but we're also collecting data. So, you know, we're monitoring it closely, showing those that the things that are important to us. So hopefully that will continue to inform the practices within the building. So. I'm just gonna say, cause it feels like it, it needs to be circular. Yeah. Like these are useful for the buildings, but then what the buildings do is useful to- Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And along those lines, is there a way to pull out you know, brainstorm is going to have an example, but pull out little snippets of things that we are working on um, that are po real positive, even throw that into our social media feeds with a link to the report. Hey, if you want to read more about this, because I know when we were originally doing this and looking at some of Bellingham's reports, they had, it was, you know, you'd go in there and it's like, wow, there were interesting things that you didn't know about, these you didn't know to go to. We went there because we were looking for it. And if we get people out, you know, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea to read it, but, it, you know, getting that out there, showing what they're doing, and just helping them to support. Yeah, because there is a lot of good stuff. In there. Well, and Jackson has copies of the books, and I just gave Selena a copy of the books, and we're there, you know, they, I, I told them that I wanted them to understand the structure of this so that they do, you know, we'll be pulled with Jackson. I could sit down and he can pull out. But remember, this is his, have you been here six weeks now? Oh, um, yeah. So, so, and Selena isn't really on, on the property yet, but we're trying to figure out how, how it can, exactly what you're saying, you know. The five of us know it's there. I go back and pull things out of there for something else. I'm writing a grant or something. But, and it, I don't think it's logical to think that everyone in the district is going to read every one of these. We'd have to give them a day off a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, but. Um, Can we get a day off a month? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Increase. Yeah. Increase. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I think even if you had, five other people in the district that were reading these, it's like that becomes either ambassador if they see things good, or it becomes an educated person that has a critique or, I mean, it's, 
Yeah, he's fantastic. Well, and again, it comes down to that conversation because the conversation you're having about curriculum education process results so much different now than what we before. had before, you know, but that's helping too in driving the direction. But yeah, if we can expand out, the more people get in it, the more people you know, should get into the discussion. All right, I'm going to ask again. Any more comments? Thank you, Dr. Quinn, for this report, and thank you, board members, for your comments tonight. If you have written comments after, or you can email them to me later. Uh, and I'll summarize those and put them on a summary sheet and get it to Jackson at some point before the next meeting. So as a reminder, we will vote on this policy report at our August meeting through the consent agenda. Just as tonight, we will be voting to accept the report on the results policy 2.9 for your readiness, which we received at our May meeting and discussed at our June meeting. That'll be on next week's all right, next item on the agenda is 5.03, and this is receiving our next policy monitoring report from Superintendent Quinn. So at this time, I will call on Linda to tell us about the report she's preparing for us. And the really good news is because you're not getting that report tonight, the items will be numbered. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I didn't, um, I just, I was talking to Mark about this is a report on financial planning. It isn't quite as long as this one, but I talked to Mark about it today. And when we, the last time we touched this report was in August of 2018. And I think you all know what kind of financial planning we've yes. had to do since then. Mm -hmm. And on all kinds of fronts, because in August of 2018, we hadn't even passed a bond. And the, um, the policy itself, the part that you had, we adopted, through our process and the monitoring indicators that we wrote are woefully inadequate to tell any kind of story. It's a very lifeless kind of document that said, you got to report every month. And so I feel compelled to write a introduction that captures more of what financial planning has been in the last three years. And last night I just didn't feel up to, and I thought you, this is a five week, so I'll get it to you by August 3rd, and I will go back in and number the monitoring indicators. I haven't seen it obviously, but I know like one of the conferences is talking about values based financial planning and maybe looking at some of those monitoring indicators to reflect what our values are and if we are putting our money where our mouth is type of thing, is that in there? Well, it's in, it, it is in the interpretation of the policy and in the policy, but but the monitoring indicators that you approved when, when I wrote them don't really hold us to account for that. The policy itself says that we will plan our finances so it supports your results and operational expectations policies which is where you express your values. However, there is not a single monitoring indicator that um, says whether we did or not. And we have spent a significant chunk of time during the last year trying to redo our district improvement plan so that it does show how our policies are related to our goals, are related to where we're spending our money. And so this is, this one's just going to need to be re the next person can do a better job than I did on this one. I mean, but I do want to write um, I want to write an introduction that I'm I'm writing some of these to my my successor as well, right? These are letters to the things that um, need, that I think need to happen, and so it's it's in there, but it's not. The last couple of years have really brought to light what our values are and our budget situation has really like you have to think about it harder. So I mean maybe before we were naive. We're not as naive anymore. We're older wiser. No, and I I don't remember another three year period of time where where 
our ability to financially plan and manage has been more called into, <laughs> into service than, uh, I mean, even, I would even go so far as to say the first time the cost estimator came to talk to us about the bond and said we were going to be $25 million short of delivering on and what Mark and I and the others have done to make sure we're going to be delivering on that has tested our metal in this area and it is not reflected in the report. So, well, and I appreciate these reports, both the introduction and like the epilogue, like the, the place yeah. where you talk about next we need to look at or the other things we need to do. And I think you're right. You are writing these to your successor at this point. Yeah. Because we want it carried on. Yeah. And this will give them a roadmap. Yeah. I'm, um, yeah, exactly. Okay. I will say one place where our budget reflects our values popped up on my Facebook page from I don't know how many years ago collecting for the school supply drive so we could give school supplies away. And that was such a such a big event and I loved it, but it was not equitable and how we rolled those school supplies for at least at the elementary level, it rolled it into where we put our money. And that was great. Well, I think we can give you another couple of days. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have a month, so I, I think you know we have five it. weeks actually. Yes, yeah, five, five weeks, weeks between this board meeting and so. I, I think you, you can take them. Yeah, so thank you. Um, well, hard copies we said. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. The next item on our agenda is six point oh one, and this is the approval of the twenty one twenty two district budget. As a reminder, both the board and the public have had multiple opportunities to review and make comments on the district budget as it was uh, published several weeks ago on board docs all the way through. And it's so we have had budget development discussions on the agenda of several of our school board meetings uh, since early spring and when Dr. Mr. Debach and their team hosted a Facebook live session. Um, and had questions and answers in June. So the final budget's been posted now for two weeks. And so, um, and as you know, we devoted a study session essentially to the budget last week. So we talked about it and talked about it and we held our public meet hearing tonight. So uh, we are legally required to approve a balanced budget by August 31st. And um, at this point, unless my fellow board members have additional comments or questions, I'm ready to entertain a motion to officially adopt the 21-22 district budget. I will put forth a motion to adopt the budget as presented. All right, so it's been moved to approve the resolution number 10-21, adopting the 21-22 district budget. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We have a budget. Motion carries. That is a standing Yeah, I was going to say thank you all for, I mean, Mark and the team and, and everybody here. You've done a tremendous amount of work. Not only meeting with us, but meeting with other folks and being available. So thank you for for all of that time that you've spent. Um, we feel good about the current strength of our financial situation. We're moving ahead in good stead. So hopefully, um, you know the, the future will be bright for us budgetarily, and we'll be able to continue the great work that we're doing. So good work. All right, sharing. So the next. Items, several items are about uh, it's a time for us to share things that are important and going on within our, our collective lives. And so I will start with the student school board members. Jazzy, I'll call on Con first. So you can think of something to share. So today I have three things to share. Um, first, 
I got appointed to be a member at LYAC, which is the Legislative uh, Youth Advisory Council. Um, hey. Only 11 people in the whole state. Uh, this, uh, this year, there was about like around 150 applicants, and I was one of them. And I was really happy. It's really exciting. Um, we are appointed for two years, we will be learning about how the legislation works and the members will be working with the Lieutenant Governor and his administration on how to analyze, revise and recommend on policies that will be impacting to students, schools and also society as a whole. So yeah. I'm smiling really big over here. <laughs> I'm so excited for you. Thank you, Councilor. I'm excited for him and I'm excited for our area of the state because I don't know if there. My son had been interested in this and it was not chosen for it. He'll love that I brought that up. <laughs> but um, I don't think there have been people from you know, like Bellingham, Watson County, it's, and just to have a premature. I'm so excited. Thank you. Um, the next uh, thing I would uh, like to say is uh, I'm working on my, you know, my student voice, you know, project will be on the August uh, meeting. But um, for my summer, the summer retreat, the topic that I will be talking about, it's drive off of like the student voice, um, you know, my projects, and also it will be connecting with learning environment. And my goal is how to change the culture of the high school. Um, three topics I think that I would, what I will be talking about would be miscommunication, trust about on student issues, priorities, um, power and balance of leadership role in our high school and opportunity issues of minorities. These are the three topics that. Yeah. Thank you for vacation. <laughs> Thank you. We're very proud of you. As I know it's your first meeting, so. Anything here? <laughs> I've got nothing. <laughs> That's okay. Um, elected board members, Terry. Next um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday will be um, the first time that I'll be getting together with the other WASPA board members down in Olympia. Um, in what a year and a half, however long it's been, forever. <clears throat> um, and we will be in the new WASDA building, which is, which is a huge deal. I'm so excited, I can hardly stand it. Um, so so that is, that's coming up. That's coming up next week. So I'm looking forward to it. Anyone else? Kind of on a personal note, um, my son, my oldest son, was a 2019 graduate of Ferndale, and he has been a camp counselor at YMCA Camp Roger this summer. And I read an article the other day in the um, New York Times. They were talking about how camp staff was, um, you know, a lot of camps would hire a full staff, and then on the day the camp was to open, 25% of them didn't show up. Or a couple weeks into it, you know, they were like, you know, I've had COVID, you know, life for the past year and a half. I don't want to be here at this camp where I can't leave on weekends. And so they have, they've had their own traumas. And so it's been difficult to keep camps open. But when we talked to my son last weekend, he said that he felt that this was his giving back because he had gone to camp and, you know, what good it did for him. So it was just like, it was, Nice to hear. So I'm just bragging about the kid. <laughs> no, it was, so. he had the greatest summer and got a tattoo the other day. It's not Metallica Bridge. No, but it is a heron to remind him of home. So. My uh, son, one of my sons had a home. Yeah, my son, or my husband told me that I cried, or I had more tears about that than I did when he graduated. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> graduation. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Yeah. What else? All right, Dr. Quinn. What do you want to talk about? Oh, well, I, I could talk about that, but 
Uh, this is my wife's book that is officially launching on August 3rd. And so um, it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and um, probably Village Books. Village Books, yeah. You can order it at Village Books and stuff. So yeah, so it's a it it it's a she's a physician and so it looks at and it was written with a genet genetic biologist or cell biologist anyway over at the Oak Ridge Center in Tennessee. So she, she knows what she's doing. Um, and it looks at how the body feels after an injury and sort of aligns some, or not aligns, but then discusses how we might heal our own wounds and issues within our society and communities following those kind of, I'm, I'm butchering her book, she would be talking about <laughs> It's been ready for a while and we're, we're, it's published by Tyndall Press and they said, but we don't want to publish it during an election. So I think that was smart. And then they said, pandemic's not quite the right time. And it looked like August was going to be a great time. So who knows? But anyway, it's out. And so yeah, we're, we're very excited. But August 3rd, see if it will launch it. I'm trying to figure out who's going to play me you know, <laughs> in the movie. Brad, I think you should play yourself. I thought I, I'll, I'll be a scan. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, so that's my show. Will that be our next board uh, or board conference, board. conference uh, movie uh, watching? Uh, we'll go see. I, I do have one thing to say, um, and Heather's here as well. Uh, Heather has been working this summer on. Are you mean grandma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's been working with Children of the Setting Sun Productions. Um, and we've engaged their services with Heather's help to create another, a second video, this one on land acknowledgement and an educational piece on land acknowledgement. And I think um, tomorrow you're going to come over and interview me, but Heather doesn't even know this. She said, who else should we interview? So today I contacted the governor and the um, state superintendent of public instruction to ask them if they wanted to be in our video. Um, the governor's office, I just had to leave something online and they said they'd get back to me. But the state superintendent, his assistant, got back to me in two minutes and said, thank you so much for asking. He's out of town, but I'll talk to him first week. So I think it will be right up Chris Rechtel's alley. He's really into since time of memorial curriculum. So anyway, I think the goal right now, Heather, feel free to chime in, but I think the goal, our goal is to have this ready to launch during November for Native American Heritage Month and make it an educational piece that happens, right? Yeah, the goal is to have the actual video done um, for sure by the end of September with the intent of working with teaching and learning so that we can design some lessons and some pre-teaching to the content of the land acknowledgement, not land acknowledgement and the history of this place before Native American Heritage Month so that we could do some pieces. Because when you read the land acknowledgement as LABC has adopted it, there's a lot of vocabulary in there. And so um, our the purpose of the video was for that educational piece and then design some lessons that feed into the classrooms and working with K-12 teaching and learning so that they're also grade level appropriate. So I just want you to know that work is going on. And then the other thing that made me really happy is our new assistant principal at Glendale High School, JJ Jensen, who doesn't sound like he's Native American, but um, is an enrolled member of, of uh, one of the First Nations. He's actually not. He's a descendant. Of, oh, a descendant. He's a descendant of his. He was um, an enrolled member of the Nooksack tribe, and then he ended up being one of the 306 that got disenrolled. Oh. And so he is a descendant of um, Reservation of Canada, Canada. Okay. But anyway, he he wrote to me when he heard about this and wants to be involved in the land acknowledgement work. He, he's really stepped up right now, and I'm going to ask Heather to reach out to him. So anyway, that's my so I, I appreciate that conversation and that back and forth that just happened. And, I, and I, I've had a little bit of back and forth with Jesse, just about us as a board 
and understanding the history in a bigger context. And so I love the idea of the land acknowledgement and understanding that history and what those words mean. But I also think about the, um, the boarding school stuff that's been coming up lately. And um, what is it as a board? How could we go deeper and understand more about the land you're on and who you're neighbors with and, um, and how those relationships and um, I've gotten to do a little bit of that work with the loss of board, but I would love to do it here with our board and the elimination and the next just to, just to have a better understanding. So I think those lessons you're creating for the kiddos would also be useful for us. Oh, absolutely. Helping that. And, and I think that and I think you know Mark says this all the time. We it's more than the kids. We need to educate our staff and we need to educate their parents because right. we're starting late in this game and they're parents. And so that's why I think these children in the setting some videos, they're not designed for little kids. They're, you know, they're, but you saw the treaty day video. That's not a, we picked out pieces of it and made it work at different age levels, but it, we're educating the community, we hope. I actually am really impressed, Leanne, that you said that. Um, I think there's a lot that, I keep saying there's a lot to be taught, there's a lot to learn, and there's so much out there. Um, I wish someday we could take the board out and around Lummi, I don't know if we have already, and show them. We never have. Show them. Since I've been here. Yeah. I've been. What's but that? Probably, yeah. and, when kids talk about it, you know, in classrooms or this area and to the teachers, then they will know what they're talking about. Um, do you know where the cove is? No. And it's simple. It's just a place out there. It's a store. And it's a place where, the, you know, a lot of the natives go because it's right there. And you'll hear a lot about that. Do you know where, of course, you should know where Wechlium is. Yes, so. <laughs> I don't. But we haven't done that in No, but I'm saying well, that's what I'm saying yeah. is that we need to. We need, yes. We, I would like, uh, this is my dream, is uh, we have a salmon barbecue, like we always do, our free food. And um, come and visit. Don't drive by just because the casino is there. Don't go and get gas just because it's right there. Come into the reservation. And drive around, you'll see how beautiful it is. Um, the videos you take that we saw, it shows how beautiful it is. And if you just take a drive out, it takes like 20 minutes around the whole reservation. And that's it. But there is a lot to see out there. And um, I hope someday we can pinpoint a day so we can do that, you know. We certainly can. Yeah. yeah, we can have a welcoming, and uh, we always want to celebrate, <laughs> <laughs> and we always want to offer food. So, that's a great study session. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So to answer your question, Leanne, I would have I would be happy to help work with that. Um, have an abundance of resources, we have an abundance of people. And just like Chairman Solomon said when he was here the other day, you know, we're very giving people. And part of our inherent responsibility is to educate people about us and our place. And the more that we understand each other and the more that we learn from each other, the more apt we are to be more cohesive. It creates that understanding and that empathy for each one of us. And the more that we have those opportunities to share that with each other, the more. It, it creates that cohesive witness. So I would be more than willing to help coordinate that for the board if that was something that the board wanted. There was an article shared um, by the Salt Lake, or written in the Salt Lake City Tribune, and I follow it on Facebook because my son in school there. But the um, totem pole, the Lemmy totem pole was going through Salt Lake City. I talked about it, and people were making comments like, you know, where's the Lummi Nation anyway? And, and sort of thing. And I was like, they're the greatest neighbors ever. 
I go other places. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very proud to see it, though, as it's going through. It's like, I know these people. And they're like, um, her, tells you directions. Oh, uh huh. She called it the meat people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but maybe yeah. we, we should look for a time. Yeah. Oh, we could do that. That was, uh, Definitely want to coincide with the same. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then uh, administrative team, effective team. Fresh out. Okay. Well, well, the final items on the agenda are the consent agenda. The superintendent's consent agenda consists of items delegated to the superintendent for action, but requiring the board's uh, final approval. The board's consent agenda cons consists of routine items for the board to uh, address. The board has had an opportunity to review all of these items prior to this meeting and is therefore able to expedite our work by taking action on them as a group rather than individually. So these same items are also available for public review on board docs. So at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I will make a motion to approve the superintendent consent agenda and the board consent agenda as attached and all right, it's been moved to approve both the superintendent's consent agenda and the board's consent agenda as attached here to and later part of the minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. So we've now reached the end of the agenda of the July 27th board meeting of the Ferndale School Board. Our next regular business meeting will be held the last Tuesday of August, which is August 31st. So thank you all for participating tonight. I hereby declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.